This week we're going to be talking about the application of faith. Now, I want you to understand something. What something looks like on paper or what something looks like in theory is worlds apart from what it looks like in reality. Because in reality, nothing ever happens in clear, simple steps. Uh, in reality, we have to have the concepts established in our heart and be able to move through them in more of an intuitive way we're alive to God because we're not just working formulas. So we're going to take all these things that we've had in, this, in these programs for the last four weeks and we're going to bring it down to how does this look in application? What does it look like in real life? And I'll tell you, you're going to get some beneficial stuff out of this that's going to help you. I encourage you to share this with your friends and be, a, be an online evangelist where you send links to these messages to people if you know that it will help them. And always remember, all of these messages are available at impactministries.com you can use them for free in your home Bible studies, in your church, or over and over for yourself. I've got great news for you. You can pre-order my book, Apocalypse, A Spiritual Guide for the Second Coming of Jesus, and you can get a special deal in this hardback 300-page book, $24.99, plus a $149 eschatology course. Yeah, today we're going to be talking about the application of faith. And you know something? When I was going to uh, medical school, I, I, my teacher said this, and I'll just never forget it. And the type of medicine that I studied, he said, the type of medicine that, that we do is, is easy to learn, hard to practice. He said, now, Western medicine is hard to learn, but easy to practice because it just comes down to formulas. Well, you know what? The Western mind kind of works that way. It kind of just works in formulas. But, uh, but the way the Word of God is taught and the way the whole Eastern world worked, the world that Jesus and the Hebrew people came from and the language that God spoke to them because it was so conceptual and because it required listening and being open to the voice of God in your heart, it made it, e it, made it easy to learn and difficult to practice, only difficult because it required being attentive or, or being aware. As a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons so many crazy doctrines come out, uh, particularly from, from North America, is because, is because we're trying to take the Word of God and make it fit into the way we want to think instead of it fitting into the way God thinks, and instead of fitting into the way Jesus taught and the way the apostles taught and the way all of the Word of God is written. We want to make this American. Uh, we want to make it English and American. So, so I'll never forget hearing that statement when the teacher said it. He said, this is, this is easy to learn, hard to apply because you have to pay attention then and you have to be open to all the variables. And buddy, when you're working with people in health, you are always working with all kinds of variables in the human body. Well, you know something? That, that helped me so much because I, I began to realize that in the application of the Word of God, it's the same way. You know, the Word of God is pretty straightforward. The issue is not what the Word of God says. The issue is, what does this look like in application? Now, when I was a, a young believer, and some of you have heard me share this, I would hear the preacher say, you ought to do this, you ought to do that, you should do this, you should. And so, so there were all of these things that you ought to do. And, I, and, and so I would go to him and I would say, well, well, I don't understand what that would look like. I, I don't understand how I would really put this into practice. Or can you show me how to do it? And it was amazing that very few of the preachers I ever asked those questions really could show me what it would look like in real life, whatever it was that they were teaching about. And uh, what I began to realize is that uh, is they couldn't show me in real life because it really wasn't a way of life for them. It was just, it, they were giving me the information from the Bible and telling me I ought to do it, but they couldn't tell me what it looked like in real life because to a great degree, they didn't have it working in their own life, didn't know how to make it work in their own life. And so that's, you know, that's what I made a really... Uh, a major decision about how I would approach ministry. I made up my mind I would never be an ought to preacher. I would never just tell people what they ought to do. I mean, there's things I can't teach you that you have to learn just as you seek to apply it. But I can, I can share as much practical information so that you don't feel like you're on a, a, at sea in a ship without a rudder or a sail. So we're going to talk about the application of faith. We're going to start kind of conceptual 
and then we're going to get down to the very practical application of it. And, and remember, the conceptual part of this is that first and foremost, you have to establish your heart in faith. Now remember, your heart is always about your identity, and, and your identity always comes from who you believe God is. Now, if you're not a believer, you're trying to get your identity from other people and you're creating an idea of who they are and who you need to be to fit in with them. Well, we are believers. We're in Christ. And so, and so we're wanting to grasp in our heart who God is and, uh, and who we are as a result of being in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, remember, you know, we, we talked about the fact that if you're not established in the, in the covenant of peace, you will always waver in this, in this very issue. You have to trust the character and the motive of God first and foremost before you get into the individual breakdown of any of the aspects of faith. Uh, secondly, you want to you stay true you know, to the process. No matter what you're doing, you want to stay true not only to trusting the character and nature of God, but knowing the uh, provisions of the new covenant. Now, remember, God did not make a covenant with you. He made a covenant with Jesus. And <clears throat> because we are in Jesus, we share in the covenant that God made with him. And the covenant that God made with Jesus is called the covenant of peace, according to Isaiah 54, which means the gospel that we preach is the gospel of peace. That means that if we want our heart to be established, our heart has to first and foremost be established in peace. And so, uh, so we haven't really understand that peace is more than just a tranquil state of mind. Peace is a tranquil state of mind because first and foremost, there is peace between God. I, I am in Jesus, therefore I am, I am as qualified as Jesus is. I am in Jesus, therefore I have His righteousness. I stand before God based on the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ, not on, on my own merits. And, uh, and this word peace also has to do with provision. So I'm not just having a positive state of mind. I'm having a tranquil state of mind as a result of knowing that in Him all of my needs have been met. So, you know, these are the provisions of the new covenant. I'm delivered from the curses of the law. And listen, I've got some incredibly powerful series on the new covenant. Uh, if you want to check them out, they will help you. They'll establish you. They'll get you settled in this thing. Secondly, you want to be sure conceptually that you're always seeking to believe for those things that have already been established. This is where you go back to the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Man, I tell you, it's amazing how we just leave that out. Our faith revolves around what Jesus accomplished through His death, burial, and resurrection. If you're unsure in what happened while He was on the cross, while He was in the grave, uh, what happened when He was raised from the dead, get my series, Three Days That Changed the World, and uh, I'm telling you what, it, it has transformed the lives of, of hundreds of thousands of people by coming to fully grasp what Jesus did at the cross. And then, of course, there's the principle of gathering evidence where you realize that where I focus my attention is going to be where I gather my evidence. And so this, this, kind, of, this kind of gets back into this concept of staying connected with God, meditating on the Word of God, focusing on the Word of God. And so, see, all of this has to do with me and God. This is not about the individual miracle right now that I'm trying to get. This just has to do with establishing my heart. Uh, in, in, in faith, in trust for God's character and motives. Um, and and then, then in faith, we want to realize that we are not trying to use our faith to create something from nothing. And I can remember being taught that. Man, I don't know about you, but that's kind of a, that's kind of a scary thing to think i got to have enough faith to create something from nothing. The real truth is I'm transferring from the invisible realm something that already exists into this natural realm. Uh, I don't know, that for whatever reason, that just takes the burden off of me. I am not the creator of anything. I am the person who creates a substructure whereby that which is, whereby that which is already in existence in the spiritual realm comes into existence and has a foundation upon which to sit here in this realm. And then, uh, and then probably uh, last of all, is you're always going to be open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Now, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit is never going to say no. And, and He's not going to lead you and say, no, this is not for you, or no, this is not your timing. But what the Holy Spirit is going to do is, is whenever you really begin to step out into individual 
situations where you're having to believe for something specific, whether it be finances, whether it be coming out of heartache and sorrow, whether it be health and healing, whether, you know, whatever it is, the Holy Spirit, He knows you. He knows all about you. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your strength. And He knows all the variables in your situation. He knows all the players involved in your life and involved in your circumstances. So the Holy Spirit is the only one that can actually lead us into the application of truth uh, if there are any variables. Now, now, remember, truth is always absolute. But the application of truth always has many variables in it. You know, there might be a, a situation where I'm believing God for something to happen uh, in, in, in the financial realm, and the Holy Spirit may lead me to go and talk to somebody. I can't tell you how many times I've just gone and had a conversation with somebody, and it ended up, you know, resulting in a, in a business deal that would sometimes profit me massive amounts of money. And uh, if I hadn't listened to the Holy Spirit, if I'd just been sitting around trying to work a faith formula, then the truth is I would have gotten frustrated and given up and it just absolutely never would have happened. So I'm not telling you to listen to the Holy Spirit because He's going to say no. I'm telling you to listen to the Holy Spirit because He's going to show you. He's always going to say yes. And he's always going to show you how to get there. So listen, th that's, that's the conceptual part. That's the establishing your heart part. But what I want you to do is come back for the next segment where I'm going to talk to you about actually putting this into practice and you're gonna know how to make this work in your life. I know you're like me, you wanna have a faith that works. You, know, you don't wanna be goofy, you don't wanna be extreme, you don't wanna be legalistic, you just wanna trust God in every situation. Faith, the missing pieces is a six CD set that really does just what it says. It gives you the missing pieces about how to live and how to walk in faith. From this, I'm telling you, you're going to learn the basics of how to establish your heart and faith, how to solve your doubt problems, how to always move to the place of faith. This is going to be a life changer for you. You know, like I said before, things always look different in practice than we imagine what they're going to look like. You know, when, when we're reading the Word of God and we're looking at something, trying to figure out how to walk it out, you know, we're just, we're just using our imagination, which we should, and we're trying to listen to the Holy Spirit, but the truth is, we've ne you know, we've never, maybe we've never seen anybody do it. You know, some of the first times that I ever d moved in the miraculous and, and either got people healed or took people through deliverance, I had never seen it done before. And so I had no idea what it was supposed to look like. Well, here's the great thing. There's usually not a one size fits all when, it's, when you're trying to figure out what something looks like. It, the Holy Spirit is gonna lead you through what it needs to look like to be most effective in that situation. And that's why the Holy Spirit is leading us. You know, it's because He wants you and the person you're ministering to or the person you're helping or whoever's involved, He wants, he wants it to be a win, win, win for everybody. Win for you, win for them, and a win for God because, because God wins when we come out. God wins whenever, whenever we live in the promise. God wins whenever we actually get this stuff to work in our life. I want to read one of the scriptures in a Mark, I mean, uh, Hebrews 11 gives us a, a definition of faith, but Mark 11 kind of shows us what it looks like in application. And this, you know, this happened whenever Jesus was walking along with the boys and one day they were, you know, they were on their way to town. They passed by a fig tree and, and he, he speaks to this fig tree and says, may no one ever eat of you again. That's interesting. He didn't say, Heavenly Father, uh, 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 kill this fig tree. He didn't say, Heavenly Father, you make this fig tree die. He didn't say, in the name of Jesus. Yeah, I mean, all he did was spoke to, because what he was doing is he was demonstrating the authority that man had been given to function on planet Earth. And so when they come back the next day, they see that this, this tree is withered. They're, they're astounded. And, and they, they want to know how it happens. And so this is what Jesus tells them. In Mark eleven twenty two, 22, Jesus answered to, answered to them, have faith in God. Now, almost everyone that I know, almost every scholar that I've ever read will actually translate this as have the, fa have the faith of God. And, and this is, uh, Jesus is saying here, Operate faith the same way that God operates faith. Do it just like God does it. See, God is a faith God. Everything about how God has designed for us to work is totally consistent with how He works, how He functions. 
because we're created in his likeness and image. You know, there's this, there's this mystical religious uh, uh, concept that really comes out of mysticism and paganism, you know, that, that the gods uh, operate on a whole different set of rules and standards than we do. Well, everything that God tells us, he tells us, look, if, you want, if you're a son and you want to be like your father, this is how you do it. You know, he tells us how he does things so that we'll know how to do things. So Jesus is saying, have, have faith of God. That word in can be in God or of God. And the context seems to point to of God, according to many scholars. Verse 23, for assuredly, I say to you, Whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast in the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he uh, says. Now, in this, in this uh, one passage right here, we have what I call the five phases of faith. Now, I don't like to use the word the five steps of faith because, like I said, when we, when we organize things around steps or a formula, it's not that the formula itself makes it wrong. It's not that having a formula itself is bad, but there is a tendency, when, once we create a formula, number one, we tend to really leave God out of it to some degree, and, and, and we're, we're trying to work the formula, and our faith is in the formula. Our faith is not in the things that Jesus has accomplished past tense. So, you know, that's, that's the number one reason. But secondly... You know, when we get in, into a formula, we tend to get rigid in what the steps should look like. And again, we're not listening to the Holy Spirit. But I like to use the word phases because these phases can overlap. They can happen in, in sometimes in different order. Uh, they're not always going to happen just exactly how they're spelled out on paper because we're dealing with heart things. We're not just dealing with intellectual steps. We're not, we're not building a, a blueprint here. So basically, I want to walk through for you what I see as the five phases of uh, applying faith, of actually walking in faith, of putting it into practice. And these are based on this scripture and based on what we know about God and how he functions. <clears throat> You know, the first thing you have to do, and buddy, this really gets sideways with some people, is you have to decide or choose the outcome that you desire. Now, many people are like, no, you know, I'm just, I just, the will of God. I just want the will of God. Well, if you want the will of God, go back to what God promised in the new covenant because the will of God is not the willingness of God. See, when most people say the will of God, they're saying, I want whatever God's willing to do, that's, that's what I want. That's not the way it works. We have a last will and testament called the new covenant, the covenant of peace. And in this last will and testament, all the promises God ever made to anyone are yes, because we're in Jesus. We are delivered from all of the curses because we're in Jesus. And we, we, we take hold of these, these promises by faith. We, we, we apprehend them by our, by our faith and bring them into ourselves, you know, by our faith, by our deep assurance and, you know, uh, trusting, being confident in God. So, but religion would tell you that, that because God is sovereign, he's got to choose the outcome for you. I, I want to tell you something, that, that really gets totally away from everything that God has spoken about himself and about man. I mean, from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, God offers all of these things freely, but we have to choose and we, we integrate them into our life because we believe that they're true and we believe in the God that's offered them. So if you don't Look at the things that God's offering. You know, if, if I'm facing a situation where, where I'm struggling, you know, with finances, then I have to look back and say, what did Jesus, what, what did Jesus die for? Well, he died to deliver me from the curse of poverty because poverty is a curse. What did he die to give me in this? Well, the Bible says that he was made poor so that I might become rich. You know, the Bible says all my needs are met according to his riches and glory. So I have to look at that and go, this is what Jesus decided. You know, this is what Jesus has already decided for me. So the question is, do I get in agreement with him? Do I decide that myself? So number one, I got to decide or choose the outcome based on the finished work of Jesus. Secondly, the Bible says that God sees or declares the end from the beginning. So the next thing I've got to do, I've got to see, I've got to perceive, I've got to experience that outcome. And this is where you get into influence in your heart. This is what biblical meditation is all about. This is where you are uh, imagining yourself 
walking in this promise being fulfilled. And, and you know, you're, this is not mind over matter. This is not new age. This is just you saying, this is a promise of God. I got to see what this looks like in real life. And, and you want this to become so real to you that you have the, the emotions of a person that is having that experience. You know, you talk about staying in peace. I'll tell you, when you're living the end result of the promise Right now, no matter what's going on, man, you are the person that's standing on the rock while the storm is raging all around you. You are the person that's going to be filled with peace that passes understanding. It doesn't even make sense. Why? Because you're already experiencing the end. Next, according to uh, Mark 11, you've got to believe in your heart. Now, believe it in your heart. That is where you, you bring your heart to the place where you are absolutely immovable. In fact, you know, here's the interesting thing about believing in your heart. To truly believe in your heart and be immovable, your, both your mind and your heart have to agree with the Word of God. You know, the Bible talks about confessing the Word, you know, and a confession means to say the same thing. Well, a confession would be when you have something in your mouth that is in the Word of God and it's in your mind, and it's in your heart. And when, you, when, you, when all of those areas are in agreement, you're immovable. Nothing's going to move you away from that promise. And I'm telling you, when you're absolute about that, you're, you're going to receive that promise. And so you believe in your heart. You become absolutely immovable in your heart. Then number four, you speak to the situation. This is where you use your personal authority. And I can't go into it you know, here because of time, and I've already covered in some previous sessions, but we go into this in great detail in the series, uh, the, uh, Faith, the Missing Pieces. But many people try to speak and speak and speak and speak and, and shout and scream and use the name of Jesus and have an incantation and a formula and a, all that kind of stuff. And they think that all of that's going to make it come to pass. How emotionally they do it, how strong they do it. No, really, you're not ready to speak with authority until you're absolutely convinced of the end. You're, you're, you're not hoping it's going to come to pass. It, it, in your experience, it has already come to pass. In your experience, there is no question that's going to happen. That's when you are ready to speak to the situation. And then according to Jesus' teaching, all you've got to do from there is just don't doubt. Well, We've already taught you. We taught you last week. What do you do? When, when doubt comes up, you know that doubt's coming up because you're wavering, because you're beginning to, you're beginning to float off in another direction and your emotions are starting to change and you're starting to wonder and you're not sure anymore. At the first sign of doubt, stop focusing on the problem. Stop focusing on what you're afraid of. Go back to the Word of God. Go back to your heart zone. And if you don't understand how to do all this stuff, contact us. Contact one of our heart physics coaches. Learn how to do heart physics. Learn how to live in heart physics. And learn how to connect with God in your heart. Come back to your heart and reconnect to the promise. Reconnect to the end so that it becomes real to you. Gather evidence. See yourself doing all the things that you would, that you would do if you were well or if your bills were paid or if you, were, if you had peace, or if you were walking in love, or if you were going to go forgive, whatever it is you want to, that, that you want to do, and you need God's grace and God's power working in you to do it, you see it in your heart. And I'll tell you what, from there it's just a simple matter of, I'm going to yield this to Jesus. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to commit myself to the grace of God. I see it. Uh, I've walked through it. So, but anytime I waver, I'm just going to come back and gather evidence for the promise. You know what? Uh, Sometimes you step from you jump from step one to step five back to step two. You know what? So because it's really not steps. That's why it's just phases of application. But according to Jesus, this is all there is to mountain moving faith. He didn't say a hundred other things that you had to know and do. He just said it was this. And I believe this functions based on the foundation of the concepts of who you are in Jesus and the new covenant. I'll be right back. This month, I've got a special free gift for you. It's called Abraham, the father of failure. And it shows you how men with the same struggles and same battles that you have overcame and God still used them mightily. It's free for everybody. Go to www.impactministries.com. 
You know, you may not know it, but Impact International School of Ministry was a residential accredited Bible college for 27 years right here in Huntsville, Alabama. And we have raised up men and women who have been incredibly successful and effective in ministry and who have gone all over the world. We have raised up people who have been incredibly successful in business because you know what? It takes the same principles to succeed at ministry as it does at business and as it does at life and as it does in a marriage. What we have found is our school of ministry equips people for every aspect of life, not just the ministry. Well, you know what? Our school is designed primarily for people who are already in the ministry, who understand what's important, who know what questions to ask. So I want to tell you something. You may already have your degree. As a matter of fact, most of the people that went through our school already had degrees that already been in the ministry. But they said, you know what? I want to find out how to be more effective in my community. I want to find out how to build healthy believers. Check us out online, Impact International School of Ministry. You can do it all right from your office. You know, when it gets down to this heart stuff, this gets you into this realm where you can do these things with somebody. And you know, it's great if you can find somebody that knows how to connect with God in their heart and spend time with them. But here's the deal. Nobody can teach you this. People can show it to you and you can see what it looks like from the outside, but actually nobody can teach you this. You know, one of the, one of the greatest things about the new covenant is this, is that God deals with every individual in their own heart. That is just incredible. But the negative side of that is that we have this tendency to think if we'll just keep gathering information, that we'll finally get it. We'll have it figured out. Well, you know something? You can gather all the information in the world. It's not going to benefit you one bit. Even if the information is right, it's not going to benefit you until you put it into practice. Now, if you don't have anybody to, to model these things to you, you know, you can always come to one of our heart physics seminars. You can always get one of our heart physics programs. And we got several ones. You go to heartphysics.com and check them out. And uh, uh, we, we have several tools that we can give you that we can help you. Uh, or you're just going to have to sit down in a room alone and shut your eyes and connect to God in your heart for yourself. And, and you can do this. And, you know, I mean, you can read books that'll help you. You can sit down with other people that do this and then you don't feel quite so awkward doing something that you've never done. But at the end of the day, you know, everything that I've done in my whole ministry has been really focused on the heart. I mean, all the, all the way back to the very, very beginning, I, I very quickly understood that it was all about the heart. And, you know, one of the things that I've seen over this 40 plus years of, of ministering and encouraging people to connect with God in their heart is that I hear a lot of people using the same terminology that I use. Now talk about the heart. Now talk about grace. Now, but, but the real truth is, uh, that's kind of, it's kind of an ought to thing. You ought to connect with God in your heart. You got to be sure and do this in your heart. You got you know, to be sure and experience grace. But at the end of the day, does that person really sit down and do it? Because if they don't, then they can't lead you down that path. Find somebody that can lead you down this path and go with you. But at the end of it, it's just going to be you connecting with God. Not talking about the heart, not getting more teaching about the heart, but you connecting with God in your own heart.